We're here today to discuss the administration's proposal to amend, renew, the, uh, amend, amend and renew the terms of our nation's compacts of free associates with the uh, Republic of Palau, the federal states of Micronesia, and the Republic of the Marshall Islands. This committee has a responsibility for matters relating to the freely associated states, including authorization and oversight of the United States economic assistance provided under the compacts of free association, and we take that responsibility very seriously. We have a time sensitivity on this issue because various provisions of the compacts are set to expire on September 30th of this year. History and current events leave no room for doubt that U.S. strategic control and close alliance with our compact partners are vital to international peace and security in the Indo-Pacific region, which is why it's so important that we renew these agreements in a timely fashion. Our compacts of free association constitute the political, economic, and security architecture that drives development and the prosperity of a larger Indo-Pacific region and bolsters and sustains security. The United States and the freely associated states have a longstanding relationship formed 75 years ago amid the destruction left by World War II when 100,000 Americans died liberating the islands. After the war, the United Nations entrusted the United States with the defense and security of the region to prevent further aggression against the U.S. and our allies and to foster sustainable economic development and self-determination for the island's peoples. The compacts of free association evolved from that true, from that true trusteeship. These are bilateral international agreements freely entered into by sovereign nations, which reflect the shared values and commitments of both the United States and the freely associated states. To date, the United States has provided at least $800 million in economic assistance to Palau, $2 billion to the Marshall Islands, and $4 billion in Microne to Micronesia, which has helped those countries invest in education, health care, infrastructure, and more. At the same time, the compacts have underwritten America's sea lines of communication throughout the Indo-Pacific while promoting regional security by granting the United States exclusive powers to control military access to the freely associated states. This is especially important considering China's rise and malign economic tactics. It is therefore vital to maintain our bilateral political, military, and economic relationship with the freely associated states under the compacts. This proposal addresses several key pillars of the compacts. First, the United States must continue to commit to address our nuclear legacy in the Marshall Islands. From 1946 until 1958, the United States tested nuclear weapons in the northern Marshall Islands. Those tests were necessary to win the Cold War against Soviet aggression, but it's important to recognize the disproportionate sacrifice borne by the people of the Marshall Islands. While the United States fully settled all legal nuclear compensation claims in the 1980s, our moral and statutory responsibility to the people of the Marshall Islands endures, especially in light of any changed circumstances. I also understand that the final compact agreements will assure greater accountability and effectiveness in the U.S. Uh, economic assistance. And I believe it's important that we ensure U.S. taxpayer dollars appropriated to these trust funds are managed and invested as intended. We must also ensure that these agreements provide the resources needed to continue economic development and mutual security in the islands. We must also ensure that these agreements provide the resources needed to continue economic development and mutual security in the islands. It is in the mutual interest of both the United States and the freely associated states to not allow the compacts to lapse. And I applaud the administration's successful negotiation of the compacts with Palau, the federal states of Micronesia. But unfortunately, I must acknowledge that the same cannot be said for the nego negotiations with the Marshall Islands, which are ongoing. The Senate is not able to give its consent to an agreement that does not exist. And I'm hopeful that negotiations with the Marshall Islands conclude quickly and in accordance with the previously agreed to memorandum of understanding so that we can take action. Congressional consideration of this legislation proposal comes as China is increasingly challenging the United States for regional influence. Renewing the compacts illustrates our commitment to a free and open Indo-Pacific. We are ready to get to work with our colleagues in the Senate, House, the administration, and the freely associated states to meet the demanding deadline for renewal and to ensure the continued success of the special relationship between the United States and the three freely associated states. I know our witnesses from the federal states of Micronesia, the Republic of the Marshall Islands, and the Republic of Palau have traveled great distances to be here, and I truly thank all of you for making that effort. 
And I look forward to our discussion today. Before I turn it over to Senator Barrasso for his opening remarks, let me just run through some logistics since we're doing things a little differently here this morning. We have two panels. The first panel before us will have witnesses from the administration, and the second panel will have witnesses from the freely associated states. We will begin with opening statements from our first panel and then turn to our second panel for their opening statements. Next, we will move to the question round for panel one, then on to panel two for questions. Now I'll turn it over to Senator Brasso for his opening remarks. Well, thanks so much, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for holding today's hearing, and thank you to our witnesses for joining us today. Uh, today we're discussing the administration's proposals for renewing the compacts of free association. The compacts were agreements between the United States and three strategically important island nations. Palau, the Federated States of Micronesia, and the Republic of the Marshall Islands make up the freely associated states. The islands are integral to our national security and our strategic interests in the Pacific. The compacts are crucial to preserving international maritime stability, maintaining geopolitical security, and countering Chinese hostility. The compacts create a mutually beneficial security and defense relationship between the United States and the freely associated states. The compacts give us exclusive military authority over the freely associated states' lands and waters. This strategic denial authority guarantees that our military can operate bases on the islands. It also allows us to deny access to any potential adversary in an area of the Pacific that is larger than the continental United States. This is a critical authority because Chinese aggression in the area is increasing. China is expanding its power in the Indo-Pacific region and is threatening the freely associated states. It's actively trying to upset the security and the power dynamic in the Pacific and threaten Taiwan. In March of this year, the outgoing uh, president of the Federated States of Micronesia outlined Chinese attempts to undermine his country's ties to the United States through bribery and threatening public officials. China has also tried to use aggressive and coercive actions against the economies of Palau and the Marshall Islands by threatening their tourism and their fishing industries. I'm pleased the administration has reached agreements with the Federated States of Micronesia and Palau. I understand the administration is continuing to negotiate with the Republic of the Marshall Islands. These negotiations need to be completed as soon as possible. It'd be in all parties' interest to have the agreement signed into law that covers all three of the freely associated states. So I look forward to hearing an update from today's witnesses on the state of the negotiations with the Republic of the Marshall Islands. Mr. Chairman, the proposal that the administration sent us is extensive. It includes a request for $7.1 billion over 20 years and numerous reforms to existing programs. This proposal requires our scrutiny. I look forward to working with you and other members of the committee to ensure the administration's proposal is fiscally responsible and does reflect our national security interests. I'd also like to highlight the contribution of the citizens of the freely associated states to the U.S. Armed Forces. They serve at high rates and with high distinction. We owe them a debt of gratitude. I'm pleased that the proposal that the administration has sent us includes provisions that will ensure these veterans receive the care that they have earned. Mr. Chairman, I look forward to a robust discussion today regarding the administration's proposal, eager to work with you and other members of the committee to ensure that the compacts of free association are renewed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Barrasso. We're going to begin with Ambassador Yuen, Special Presidential Envoy for the Compact of Negotiations. Then we'll go to Ambassador Cantor, Assistant Secretary for Insular and International Affairs with the Department of Interior. And finally, we'll have Dr. Mohandas, uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for East Asia with the Department of Defense. Um, Ambassador Yun, we'll start with you. Thank you, sir. Chairman Manchin, distinct, uh, Ranking Member Barrasso, distinguished members of the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee, thank you for this opportunity to testify before you today. With your permission, I'll make short remarks and then submit a longer testimony for the record. Thank you. Our history with the three freely associated states, Palau, Micronesia, and Marshall Islands, began nearly 80 years ago. After World War II, the United Nations assigned the U.S. as administering authority over the trust territories of the Pacific Islands, which included Micronesia, Marshall Islands, and Palau. The compact grew out of this relationship. Our compacts with Micronesia and the Marshall Islands entered into force 1986 and with Palau 1994. 
The compact reflects that these countries are sovereign nations in free association with the United States. Under the compact, the FAS government conducts their own foreign relations, and the United States has full authority and responsibility for defense and security matters. As noted, FAS citizens also serve in U.S. armed forces and volunteer at per capita rates higher than most U.S. states. The compacts, in fact, define our relationship with each freely associated state and, had become, and have become the bedrock of U.S. policy and strategy in the Pacific. The three compacts do not expire, although each can be terminated in accordance with applicable provisions of the compacts. However, economic assistance provisions of the compacts do expire, and they are, of course, central to the mutually beneficial relationships of the compacts. And unless renewed, these economic assistance provisions will end after fiscal year 2023 for the FSM and RMI and fiscal year 2024 for Palau. Our strategic competitors are, of course, well aware of this. At this time of genuine competition from the People's Republic of China, we certainly should not take the historic friendship with our FAS partners for granted. Mr. Chairman, we have coordinated closely across the interagency to develop robust proposals to continue assistance over all three countries. With me today are my two colleagues, Interior Assistant Secretary Carmen Cantor and Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense Siddharth Mohandas. They and their teams have been instrumental in the progress we have made. I'm also delighted that you have invited President Whips of Palau, FSM Chief Negotiator Leo Falcom, who I might add was a colonel in the U.S. Uh, Marines, uh, and RMI Foreign Minister adding, we have worked very closely with them and their teams. I'm deeply appreciative of the genuine cooperation of all my all three counterparts, and uh, two of them are, of course, here, Palau Finance Minister Wudui and FSM Chief Negotiator Leo Falcom, and until a month ago, RMI Foreign Minister Kitlan Kabua. I would also like to highlight the instrumental role played by Palau President Whips with us today also, and FSM former President Panuelo. Uh, they are, these leaders are true friends of the United States, sharing our values of open society and our policies for open and democratic uh, Indo-Pacific. Mr. Chairman, as you noted, our proposed legislation requests $7.1 billion over the next 20 years to fund two agreements. Uh, these agreements uh, have been signed, Palau and FSM, but also include the amount specified in the Memorandum of Understanding with the Marshall Island, although we have not yet reached the final agreement uh, with, the, with the RMI and the negotiations are ongoing. The $7.1 billion also include $0.6 billion for the U.S. Postal Services to continue to provide uh, uh, postal services to the FAS. The legislation also provides authorities under U.S. domestic law to, to provide services, especially in, uh, for the uh, uh, veterans in the FAS. Mr. Chairman, we appreciate your continued support for our legislation with the FAS and welcome the opportunity to work with you and your committee to secure long-term U.S. strategic impact in this vital region. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And now we'll go with uh, Ms. Cantor. Chairman Manchin, Ranking Member Barrasso, and distinguished members of the committee, the Department of the Interior welcomes the opportunity to join Congress today to recognize the importance of the Federated States of Micronesia, FSM, the Republic of the Marshall Islands, RMI, and the Republic of Palau, collectively the Freely Associated States, or FAS, to U.S. national interests in the Indo-Pacific for more than 75 years. A month ago, the administration submitted a legislative proposal, the Compact of Free Association Amendments Act of 2023, to the U.S. Congress. The proposal contains funding and related provisions necessary to implement agreements related to the compacts that the United States negotiated with FSM and Palau. The proposal also includes funding for agreements relating to future assistance to be negotiated with the RMI 
based on a memorandum of understanding that we signed in January. This full legislative package will deepen our relationships with the FAS over the coming decades and serves as a clear signal of the United States' commitment to achieving and maintaining a free and secure Indo-Pacific region. According to the U.S. Government Accountability Office, in 2018, after over 70 years of close social, political, economic, and cultural ties, first under the U.N. trusteeship and then as sovereign nations in free association with the U.S., there were an estimated 94,000 FAS individuals living in the U.S. with the presence in nearly every state and territory. To put this in perspective, 94,000 is equivalent to about half the total population of the three nations. Moreover, roughly half of the FAS population in the U.S. are now U.S. citizens. These FAS communities serve in the U.S. military, and they live, work, and pay taxes throughout the U.S. For the past 35 years, the compacts have been a foreign policy, national security, and people-to-people -people success story. The administration's proposal builds on this success story. It includes supplemental provisions that rectify two long-standing challenges for FAS citizens. First, adopts language from the Bipartisan Compact Impact Fairness Act, which restores eligibility for key federal public benefit programs for FAS individuals while they are lawfully present in the U.S., an important long-term solution to the financial impacts of these communities on U.S. state and territorial governments. Second, our proposal also includes language to achieve the same goals as another bipartisan bill to provide U.S. military veterans residing in the FAS with improved access to the Department of Veterans Affairs benefits they earn and rightfully deserve for their service. However, the brave FAS citizens who have chosen to return home after their service face challenges to receiving their full benefits. These provisions will remove restrictions from the Secretary of Veteran Affairs that currently impede the offering of medical care to these service members. We have reached agreements of, or understandings for future compact assistance for each country that continues U.S. assistance in a reasonable and prudent manner. That includes assistance for education, health, environmental issues, and infrastructure. The United States and FSM agreed to a package that will provide $2.8 billion in grants over 20 years for core public services and infrastructure. The United States and Palau agreed to a package that will provide $729 million in grants over 20 years for core public services and infrastructure. While the United States and RMI have yet to complete negotiations on a full suite of agreements, we signed a memorandum of understanding in January, reflecting an understanding that we will offer assistance totaling $2.3 billion. While some people may argue that the United States is spending too many resources to secure renewed engagement through these compact-related agreements, others will counter that the United States as a Pacific nation itself cannot afford to abandon decades of investment in these special relationships as such a critical time for the Indo-Pacific region. The compact-related packages will be debated in the United States Congress and national legisl legislatures of our compact partners. Now is the time to send a clear signal across the Pacific that these compacts and their related agreements are a cornerstone of U.S. national interests in the Pacific. The Department of the Interior urges Congress to swiftly introduce and approve this compact-related implementing legislation. Let us conclude our work with Congress and for the American people to secure a bipartisan success that lays to rest how committed the United States is to the Pacific and to remain the preferred partner for our friends and cousins in the Pacific Islands. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And now we have uh, Dr. Mohandas. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, Chairman Manchin, uh, Ranking Member Barrasso, and members of the committee, thank you for inviting me today to testify about the importance of renewing the Compacts of Free Association for the Department of Defense and the critical role that the compact states play in implementing the national defense strategy and our strategic vision for the Indo-Pacific region. The compact renewal comes at a time of unprecedented U.S. commitment to the Pacific Islands. In September of last year, the Biden administration released the first ever Pacific Partnership Strategy, which prioritizes broader and deeper engagement with the Pacific Islands and identifies the successful conclusion of the compact negotiations as a key objective. Uh, we are moving out on implementing that strategy in close coordination with our allies and partners, including through the Partners in the Blue Pacific Initiative. 
As you've heard from my colleagues, we have made great progress toward uh, renewing the compact agreements. And we have appreciated recent opportunities to engage with both congressional members and staff on the importance of the renewal. And we are here today to seek the committee's support to ensure the continued economic assistance for the compact states. The defense rights guaranteed by the compact agreements provide security not only for the compact states, but for the broader Pacific Islands re region and for the U.S. homeland as well. I can tell you today that the renewal of the compact agreements is vital to the Department of Defense's ability to deter aggression and, if necessary, prevail in conflict, ensuring peace, security, and stability in the Indo-Pacific. The most comprehensive challenge uh, we face to U.S. national security, as identified in the Department's 2022 National Defense Strategy, is the PRC's coercive and increasingly aggressive effort to change the status quo of the Indo-Pacific region and the international system to align with its interests. The PRC seeks to challenge U.S. alliances and partnerships in the Indo-Pacific and leverage its growing capabilities, including its economic influence, to coerce its neighbors and threaten their interests. The PRC has also expanded and modernized nearly every aspect of the People's Liberation Army with a focus on offsetting U.S. military advantages. As the National Defense Strategy states, the PRC is the peacing challenge for the department. With our Pacific Island partners, we are bound by a shared history, shared values, and profound links between our people. A, renew a renewal of the compact honors our commitments to the people of the freely associated states and facilitates continued strategic partnerships with our Palauan, Micronesian, and Marshallese partners, which is critical uh, to our ongoing operations, force posture, and footprint in the Indo-Pacific region. Additionally, as has been noted, a unique aspect of our relationship with the freely associated states is their commitment and service in the U.S. military, which the Department of Defense is forever grateful for. The compacts of free of association determine our long -term, demonstrate our long-term commitment to our Pacific Island partners, uh, and they provide value across two priority areas. First, assured access under the compacts provides locations for bilateral and multilateral training, exercises, and force posture. And the assured access guaranteed by the compact agreements protects the strategic approaches of the United States and allows us to operate freely uh, in critical terrain in the Pacific. In addition, the compact also allows the establishment of defense sites, like the U.S. Army Garrison uh, Installation and Missile Defense Testing Site at Kwajalein in the Marshall Islands. Uh, we have also engaged in construction of the tactical multi-mission over-the-horizon uh, radar in Palau, and the Department of Defense is working towards de designating further key defense posture sites uh, in Palau, as well as in the Federated States of Mi Micronesia, to facilitate agile combat employment for the U.S. Air Force. Failure to enact implementing legislation for the, new comp uh, for the new compacts would complicate our ongoing efforts to advance these defense initiatives. Second, the compacts provide for a mutual commitment between the United States and the FAS. The compacts provide strategic denial rights for the FAS enabling the United States to deny adversaries and third parties access to the territory, airspace, and territorial waters of the FAS, which is coupled with the United States' significant role as the defense force for the freely associated states. The compacts are an important signal to both our partners and our competitors of the United States' commitment to the FAS and that that commitment is ironclad. That is why we at the Department of Defense urge uh, the speedy passage of this legislation, and we thank you very much for your time and attention today. I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much. I want to thank the first panel, and I know we have to play musical chairs now. If the second panel could come forward, please. And then we'll come back again with the first panel so we can have our questions. First of all, thank you all for, for making the effort to be here, and it's going to be very helpful for all of us uh, to uh, get a conclusion here. Uh, I want, we're going to start with President Whips, Jr. from the Republic of Palau. Then we're going to go to uh, Mr. Falcom, 
and then we'll finally have Minister adding uh, adding uh, uh, foreign affairs and trade for the Republic of the Marshall Islands. So we'll start with Mr. President Whips Jr. You want to give your testimony, sir? Do that one more time. Okay. Chairman Manchin, Ranking Member Barrasso, distinguished members, Ali from Palau, and thank you for this hearing. Accompanying to me, me today are Compact Negotiator Udui, Senator Suino, Delegate Rolulga, Ambassador Kiora, and my family. The relationship between the U.S. and Palau began with fierce battles that decimated our islands and a final step in retaking the Philippines. Since the war, the U.S. has sought to preserve its strategic control from Hawaii to the Philippines and Indonesia with financial and domestic program assistance. Palauans wanted self-government, but grew to admire and feel a deep kinship with the U.S. The solution was free association. President Reagan, in urging acceptance, said, you will always be family to us. Palau is the westernmost freely associated state. We have a landmass similar in size to Guam and an EEZ the size of Texas. We also provide land needed for U.S. defense. And the military says Palau is part of, quote, the homeland. The U.S. has put its closest to Asia early warning radar in Palau. Yet we are challenged economically as a small island state. The compact provides Palauans with free access to the U.S., domestic federal programs, and financial assistance, primarily through a trust fund that was to last for 50 years, but which has proven inadequate. Wisely, it also required joint reviews of Palau's needs with a U.S. commitment to act on these. This legislation would do just that. The legislation would not only provide needed financial stability, and program assistance for 20 years, but a basis for this continuing after. Palau and the U.S. are joined at the hip, and Palau recognizes Taiwan's right to exist. Continuation of the relationship, however, can't be taken for granted. Palau is being subjected to extreme economic carrots and sticks to shift its alliances. China, our largest source of tourists, cut off visits when we did not follow their request. This, coupled with the pandemic, shrank our economy by more than 30%. Our economy has not fully recovered. China has offered to send more tourists than ever and make huge investments if we shift. For the last 10 years, China has provided the largest amount of economic investment. The U.S. doesn't have a command economy, this legislation is geared toward growing Palau's economy, not only through its economic assistance, but through a joint economic advisory group and in annual economic consultations. There are, though, three additional measures that should be addressed. One is to reestablish an Office of Freely Associated State Affairs in the State Department with coordinators from Interior and Defense departments that have greater equities than state. The Congress insisted on such an office in initially acting on the compacts. State, however, later got rid of it. Some at state want to treat the freely associated states like other island nations, but our relationships are much more closer than the U U.S. has with any other nation. N none let the U.S. exercise aspects of their sovereignty. None have U.S. domestic programs. This compact review succeeded only after we got Presidential Envoy Yoon, who could ensure attention from top decision makers and worked out fair solutions. But we need constant policy level attention. We are on the front line of competition, and not just because the early warning radar makes us a first target. Thus, my second request is that you urge the administration to complete the negotiations with the U.S. program agreements while Envoy Yoon is in office. And finally, I request the restoration of FEMA coverage. Typhoon Mawar just devastated Guam, and we know 
FEMA is critical to recovery. Our relationship was significantly undermined by the failure to implement the 2010 agreement for eight years while Palauans were being wooed by China. Enacting the legislation by the negotiated date, September 30th, is critical. Palau's Congress has ratified the agreement. I support it. I respectfully request that you and your colleagues do too. Thank you for your past support and for your consideration. Sula. Thank you. Now we'll have Mr. Falcom. Thank you, sir, and good morning. Chairman Manchin, Ranking Member Barrasso, members of the Energy and Natural Resources Committee, thank you very much for convening this hearing and the opportunity to testify before you today. I bring you greetings and respect from the people of the Federated States of Micronesia and our President, President Simina. My name is Leo Falcom, Jr. I am the Chief Negotiator for the Federated States of Micronesia in the current talks with the United States. I've also had the privilege to serve as Chief of Staff to uh, the last three presidents of the FSM. The United States and the FSM enjoy an extraordinarily close relationship that continues to deepen through our broad diplomatic, economic, and military partnership and the steadfast support of the United States for the FSM's economic development and self-sufficiency. Our governments are committed to building a safe, peaceful, and democratic Indo-Pacific region. The FSM has no greater friend than the United States. Our deep bonds are reflected in our decades of close cooperation dating back to shortly after World War II and continuing when the FSM became a sovereign nation in 1986. The ties between our peoples are also reflected in the fact that the FSM, we have FSM citizens who have proudly served in the U.S. military and are continuing to do so at very high rates. Thousands of FSM citizens proudly live, work, and study in the United States, contributing economically and culturally as members of their communities across many of your home states. We are most grateful for this privilege. When the FSM achieved independence in 1986, we entered into our first compact of free association with the United States. The 1986 COFA, as it's called, was renewed and amended in 2003. Congress approved both prior COFA agreements with resounding bipartisan support, and we are pleased that this bipartisan support has not only endured, uh, but is strengthened in the current Congress. Since the first compact entered into force, the FSM has continuously granted the United States security and defense rights in our territory, which represents a very large section of the Pacific Ocean of utmost strategic importance to both the U.S. and the FSM. This includes the right of the U.S. military to operate in the FSM and to deny foreign militaries access to use of FSM's territory. This defense partnership is vital to securing and maintaining peace and prosperity throughout the Pacific. Our defense ties remain strong and ongoing. In addition to the broad rights of strategic denial in our extensive waters and airspace, the U.S. Embassy in the FSM includes a U.S. military attache who is in constant communication and collaboration with our government. As the U.S. military knows well, the FSM is prepared to do even more on military issues. While these crucial defense commitments do not expire, we are at a crossroads on economic support by the United States. The Compact's economic assistance commitments will expire in less than three months, unless extended or renewed by this Congress. I am pleased that the FSM and the U.S., under both the Trump and Biden administrations, diligently developed the framework for a new 20-year period of assistance. The package is designed to address the needs of our government and people as we advance towards increased self-sufficiency and maturity as a nation. The Compact's pledge of $140 million a year in sector grants and $500 million in additional Compact trust fund contributions are essential to advancing our government's mutual goals. We are extremely pleased that the proposed legislation will ensure that the FSM citizens living lawfully in the U.S. are again eligible for key public benefits as a result of bipartisan Compact Impact Fairness Act. We appreciate the leadership of so many members of Congress on this issue, including Senators Hirono, Bozeman, and Schatz. The proposed legislation also incorporates the Bicameral and Bipartisan Care for COFA Veterans Act, which is, will provide improvements to medical care access to our veterans, thanks to the leadership again of Senator Schatz, Hirono, Murkowski, and Bozeman. This package will ensure the continued eligibility of FSM students for key education benefits and access to crucial federal programs and services. These measures will strengthen our country for generations to come. United States assistance will build on the advances made to date and enable the following important developments in this assistance period. Increasing educational opportunities for children, teacher training, building and maintaining schools 
upgrading the level of medical care in some hospitals, and increasing access to basic health care in our remote islands, protecting our environment and addressing the increasing effects of climate change in our vulnerable country, developing public infrastructure to include roads, ports, and bridges. At this stage in our development, more than half of key government services in the FSM are funded by the U.S. through the compact. A funding lapse would create an unprecedented economic and political crisis for our country and our people and would have an overall destabilizing effect in the region. We appreciate the committee's consideration of the compact proposal and urge Congress to advance it before current provisions expire at the end of this fiscal year. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify, and I'd be pleased to answer any questions. Thank you very much. And now we'll go to Mr. Adding. Minister Adding, I'm sorry. Minister Adding. Thank you, Chairman. <laughs> Mr. Chairman and distinguished members, thank you for this opportunity. I am joined by our Parliament Speaker, Kerry, and new Chief Negotiator, Mr. Miller. First, understand that the RMI regards the compact of free association relationship as mutually benefits, beneficial. Second, we appreciate the effort of the UH administration that favorably resolved many issues, but not all that must be. In January, the RMI was presented with a dilemma, a deadline for, the president, for President Biden's budget. The MOU was signed on our side without the proper authorization. We have repeatedly requested further negotiation, but have received unfavorable responses. So we ask you to direct the administration to resume the talks. The major issue is inadequate funding related to nuclear weapon tests that the U.S. conducted while it administered the Marshall Island as a trustee for the United Nations. The yield was equal to 1.7 Hiroshima bombs every day for 12 years. The radioactive iodine was 42 times more than in Nevada and 50 times in Chernobyl. In 1954, U.S. officials learned that a change in wind would blow test fallout to inhabited atolls. Almost 70% of the children on Ronlap who were under 10 developed thyroid cancer. Ronlap was evacuated after the test, but two years later, it was still, uh, quote, by, the, by far the most contaminated place on Earth, end quote. According to U.S. Atomic, Atomics Energy Agency Health and Safety Laboratory Director Merrill Eisenbach, he nonetheless succeeded in sending the people back home so they could be used as human guinea pigs. The people of Ronglap and Udra did indeed become human guinea pigs without their consent under the secret radiation study code name Project 4.1. Many of our people who were exiled from their atolls eventually returned based on U.S. assurances that it was safe, only to find out a year later that the radiation levels were too high and no local food could be consumed. Some islands will be unsafe for as long as anyone can imagine. The people of Bikini have exiled uh, since 1954 and Ronglep since 1985 because of high radiation contamination. Former Attorney General Thornburg found its procedure proper and compensation manifestly inadequate. The comebacks include procedure for remedies. One is a changed circumstance, circumstances petition. Still, the comeback w was negotiated, we learned since the comeback was negotiated, we learned that there was significant fallout on at least six more at all than the four recognized at the time of the comeback by the U.S. as the, the mid-range. Cancer increased substantially. The U.S. National Cancer Institute estimated 500 excess cancers. Grandchildren born on atolls other than the four recognized by the U.S. have been born with defects such as no limbs. Radioactive waste from Nevada was dumped in the Nevada Lagoon. When the compact was amended in 2003, the State Department negotiator assured that the nuclear issue would be seriously addressed if the RMI submitted a changed circumstances petition. After we did, state dismissed it. 
and others suppose remedy procedure commits the U.S. to engage in consultation if the RMI requested, stayed as refused. The MOU favorable will respond to many of our concerns, but we will not be put off again. We need the contributions of the to the compact uh, to the compact trust fund to be adequate for the nuclear tribunal awards. The contribution can also cover the cause of damages in other atolls and other issues. As a low-lying atoll state, climate change is the most significant significant security threat facing the RMI and U.S. In that regard, we seek your support. Our full proposal is in, rhythm, in my written writing submission. We do not want to hold up this important legislation for the RMI, but need additional measures to allow our people and parliaments to support it. During this period, which we want to expect, expect we request financial assistance and U.S. program and services at the current level. It is now too late uh, for a fair and just re agreement. Thank you. Thank you. And now if we could make musical chairs one more time and we'll go back to our first panel for questions. I want to thank you all back, and uh, I'll start the questioning now. I have three three questions. I'm going to try to get to all three, so if your answers could be pretty pretty short to this. Uh, I think I'll go to Ambassador Yuan uh, first. Uh, Ambassador, you noted in your testimony that representative of the governments from each freely associated state signed a memorandum of understanding earlier this year, so all, all of them signed. Uh, it's our understanding that in doing so, they all accepted a good-faith top-line offer of $6.5 billion dollars in direct economic assistance, assistance over 20 years. I also understand that the total compact proposal includes funding for the U.S. Postal Service of $634 million, which brings the total package to $7.1 billion over 20 years. That was all agreed to, I understand. And as you noticed in your testimony, as I noticed in your testimony, it is important that we successfully renew the compacts of the Free Association to avoid any lapse in our assistance, the U.S.'s assistance, to all of our these important partners. So I'm asking, uh, the compacts uh, of free association with the federal states of Micronesia, Palau, and the Republic of Marshall Islands is important to the United States. It's important to the uh, compact and to the islands and also to us. So it's mutually important. Why is the mandatory funding necessary? Quickly, if you can. Uh, so mandatory funding is necessary so that these island states can plan their future. Uh, we had an experience. Uh, mandatory funding started when? What years did we actually start mandatory funding? We've done funding? it every, every time. The, uh, the first time, 80, 80, 84, so we did it. started it. in 1980s. Yeah, and, and we also did it in 2003. Gotcha. The only one we didn't do it was for Palau uh, in, in, uh, for their last agreement, and we didn't do it. As a result, their agreement took eight years to be... Uh, passed by the Congress, and as a result, they could not plan yearly budget and so on. This is why they... So it they gives you sustainability. It's yes, important sir. for them to have sustainability, to be able to plan their life out for the next 20 years and be able to take care of their, their, their yes, citizens. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. My second question is going to be also uh, to you and to Ambassador Cantor. Uh, the proposal requests the funding for the compacts be appropriated to a new compact assistant fund administered by the Secretary of State rather than the Secretary of Interior, even though jurisdiction and, and responsibility will still will remain with the in, Interior Department. Uh, since 86, Congress appropriated funds for compacts to the Secretary of Interior as the Secretary is the most appropriate uh, uh, official to fulfill his responsibility. So why did the administration propose the change? Secretary, uh, Honorable Cantor, uh, Secretary Cantor, we'll start with you. And then we'll go back to, to Mr. Thank Arnold. you, sir. Um, I understand that OMB, the administration, chose state due to the current focus on the regional, on the region, on China. Uh, as you know, the world has changed over the last 20 years. 
Uh, my understanding is that there is going to be a new account at the State Department, but at the same time, they're going to leverage uh, our expertise, you know, at DOI since we've been implementing this since the 1950s. Is this another layer? Is it, can it cause us more uh, bureaucratic uh, t uncertainty? It, it could. It's something that, you know, we ask, you know, why OMB, you know, chose this. So but you, it's basically so you weren't, you didn't, you didn't offer it up and say, let them help us. My understanding is that we didn't, we didn't offer Okay, we'll find, we'll figure this one out. Okay, we're going to figure that one out. Mm -hmm. Now, my final question uh, goes uh, to, uh, to Ambassador Yoon and Special Envoy, really all three of you. We understand that negotiations with the Marshall Islands have yet to conclude. This is concerning because Congress faces a dawning deadline to complete our work in the compacts uh, before the end of this fiscal year. What is the plan for the compact negotiations with the Republic of Marshall Islands to get this finished? And if, you, if we'll start with Dr. Mohandas, and we'll go right up the chain. Um, thank you, sir. So we, we are not directly involved in the, the negotiations, so I'll defer to uh, Ambassador Yoon on that. But what I will say is from the department's perspective, we are strongly in favor of a uh, quick resolution of the issue. Ms. Cantor. Um, sir, uh, we are hopeful that we will resume negotiations with the RMI, but if the amendments to the compact uh, with FSM are not ratified by uh, September 30th, uh, and there is no other extension of the funding, FSM will need to rely on their compact trust fund for financial assistance. This will be the same thing with RMI, and then with Palau, the economic assistance doesn't expire until 2024, so they will continue to receive economic assistance. I think the question was directed to you, Doctor, uh, Mr. Yoon, uh, because you have been the special envoy for compact negotiation. Tell me what's going on and what's the hiccup here. Look, uh, sir, I mean, to be completely frank with you, uh, we have offered them $2.3 billion over the next 20 years, and that memorandum was signed some months ago. And, uh, and so it does puzzle me as well why it has become not acceptable. Of course, the, the reason they state is that it's because the nuclear issues have not been resolved. The nuclear issues have not been resolved yet. I'd like to point out two aspects of nuclear issues. One is, as you rightly mentioned, sir, uh, our legal responsibility for nuclear uh, liability has been met, and they have agreed to that. that was, settled still, in, was that not settled in the 1980s? It was settled in 1980s. But we've always still but we've tried always, the needs of the system. Exactly. We've always felt that there were additional needs. Uh, we, we still feel that way, right? We still feel that way, which is why within the $2.3 billion that uh, we offered them, $700 million was set aside trust. to to put into the trust fund. And that 700 million could be used for development, education, environment issues of nuclear uh, atolls, as well as other atolls. So in the, from the beginning, RMI government has insisted that they would like to have a bigger role in setting up their priorities. So which is why we put that aside for them to decide how they want to apportion them with obviously some oversight from the United States. Thank you so much. And I think when we get to our second panel, we'll get uh, a little bit more into this uh, uh, concerns. With that, I'll turn to my friend, Senator Brasso. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ambassador Young, and just if I could say, will you commit to keeping members of this committee informed on negotiations as they unfold on this critical matter? Absolutely so. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Mohammed Durs. Uh, as I mentioned during my opening statement, uh, the compacts of free association provide us with strategic denial rights. This means the United States has the exclusive authority to make national security decisions on the lands and waters surrounding the freely associated states. The, uh, the space outlined on this map is uh, in orange, is, uh, this chart is the exclusive economic zone of the freely associated states uh, up here. And, and you're familiar with that for everyone else to see. Uh, it's nearly as large as the continental United States, the area here. So can you detail the importance of strategic denial rights to our national security and to the stability of the Indo-Pacific region? Sir, uh, thank you for the question, and, and I think you've, you've stated it well. Um, the combined uh, maritime expanse co uh, covered by the freely associated states 
is, as you note, um, the uh, equivalent to the size of the continental United States in a key strategic terrain in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, what we get from um, uh, Title III of the Compact um, are two fundamental things. One is unfettered access um, uh, for access basing and overflight, which allows freedom of operation in this uh, area. Uh, and the second is exclusive access. We have the ability to uh, deny uh, foreign militaries access uh, and the ability to operate uh, in the exclusive economic zones of the freely associated states. Uh, and this is a critically important at a time when, as I noted, uh, China is becoming increasingly active and aggressive uh, throughout the Indo-Pacific. Uh, so these rights are a critical strategic advantage uh, for, uh, for the United States. Um, they are critical to our strategy in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and that is why we uh, strongly endorse passage of the economic assistance package, because we see that as reinforcing of our security uh, guarantees. And Ambassador Yan, China is aggressively engaging in the Indo-Pacific region, uh, working to rapidly increase their power, their influence. Uh, she concerned all of us that in April of 2022, the Solomon Islands signed a security pact with China. China continues to threaten the freely associated states and other U.S. territories. Could you explain how renewing the compacts of free association will help to counteract China's aggression in the region? There's no question in my mind that both the economic provisions and security provisions will ensure that these compact states will not be in any way aligned with China. Uh, so, I mean, I also want to point out that these are countries that we've had a historic relations with. They share the same culture, and many of them have English as their spoken language, and many uh, of our, our, our compact states folks live in the United States, where I come from in Oregon. Uh, we are home to many Marshallese and Micronesians there. And so, given these factors, it is not, I would say, just about China, but also about open society and also about historic ties. These are special relations. I'm used to working with countries like Japan and Korea where we have alliance relations, but compact relations are a step beyond that because we are also in charge of their defense and security. Uh, so these are vital relations. And I, I believe the economic elements uh, uh, will ensure that for the foreseeable future, we will continue this uh, type of strategic as well as historic relations with three critical states. Thank you. Thank you. Well, then, Secretary Cantor, you know, please explain what your department's going to do if an agreement isn't reached with the Marshall Islands before the current compact expires. Senator, I, I mentioned a few minutes ago that uh, if the amendments to the compact, for example, with, with the FSM are not ratified, the FSM will need to rely on their compact trust fund for financial assistance, as you know, it was envisioned back in 2000, 2003. Similarly, the U.S. and the RMI have not come to an agreement on renewing certain economic provisions, uh, and without a CR funding extending the economic assistance, the RMI will have to rely on distributions from the trust fund as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Senator Heinrich. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Palau, Micronesia, the Marshall Islands, uh, these are our friends. They are our allies. And while our relationship with the freely associated states has always been important, uh, I would argue it has never been more important than it is today. Uh, I want to thank the leadership of the Republic of Palau and the Federated States of Micronesia for their efforts to complete this compact. And I would urge both the Republic of the Marshall Islands and our administration to quickly complete negotiations um, with respect to the compact as well. Uh, it's important to realize we have a very complex relationship with our friends in the Pacific. Uh, my father was present in the Marshall Islands when our nation exploded nuclear devices on both Bikini and Anawitak atolls. Uh, Chairman, in my view, that history creates a special responsibility with respect to the Republic of the Marshall Islands 
and seems to be at the core of why we don't have complete agreement uh, with respect to RMI just yet. Uh, but all of our island friends in the Pacific are critical, and time is short, and the need to resolve the terms of the compact has never been greater. Uh, I want to thank the chairman for holding this hearing, and I would just urge all of us uh, in the administration, in these freely associated states, and those of us in uh, the Senate to work in good faith to move forward with renewal of this compact expeditiously. Ambassador Yoon, I want to ask you a question, um, very open-ended question, but the Chinese government is continuously attempting to exert influence in the region, as demonstrated by their recent agreements with the Solomon Islands, with Kiribati. What sort of void is the United States leaving if we don't successfully finalize these agreements and continue robust diplomatic efforts in the Pacific? We've already seen that quite a bit, even among the compact states. And in fact, about three months ago, uh, President Panuelo of uh, FSM wrote an 11-page letter, essentially telling his population what this is all about, which is corrupting politicians there, which is bringing in a Chinese labor to do their own, uh, uh, their own construction there, as well as, of course, illegal fishing and so on. And so f I, I, I would really urge everyone to read President Panuelo's uh, piece there. And, 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 and to me, it brought home, not just on compact states, but throughout Pacific, the challenge that is China. Yeah, Ambassador, I could not agree more. And I want to follow up on that issue that you raise of illegal fishing with uh, Dr. Mohandas. Uh, the administration and Congress needs to be actively engaged with all of the freely associated states and across the Pacific. And lack of engagement on our parts seed space and influence to the Chinese government at a time when we simply cannot afford to do so. Uh, one of the things I'm most concerned about is illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing uh, in the Pacific. Uh, I, it, it's something that, when I was in the Marshall Islands, was raised repeatedly to me. Um, sharing defense and intelligence community, intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance capabilities and information with the freely associated states is imperative in their ability to defend their economy, their sovereignty, and the livelihood of their people. Does the Department of Defense actively share ISR information about illegal fishing near and around the freely associated states with the governments of Micronesia, Palau, and the Marshall Islands? And how are we ensuring that the freely associated states and the U.S. are sharing intelligence and information in an effort to protect their economy. Doctor. Um, Senator, thank you for the question, and I absolutely agree with you. Um, IUU fishing is an incredibly uh, serious issue in the region. Um, what we see is that China is essentially sending out vast armadas of fishing fleets with associated maritime uh, militia to engage um, in illegal and unreported fishing on an industrial scale. Uh, this depletes fish stocks. Uh, this is damaging to the environment, uh, and this harms the livelihoods of communities that are dependent on fishing. Uh, so we agree on the seriousness of the issue. Uh, I can report that the Department of Defense is very focused on enhancing the maritime domain awareness of our Pacific partners, and in particular, the COFA states. Uh, the president uh, last year announced the Indo-Pacific Maritime uh, Domain Awareness Initiative, uh, which seeks to collect commercially available satellite data uh, aggregate it and uh, provide it uh, uh, to our Pacific partners through a common platform. Um, critically, um, uh, a feature of this platform is that it also will um, illuminate so-called dark shipping. Right. So ships that have turned off their transponders are still uh, picked up by this commercially available satellite data. Uh, we are working with our partners in the Quad, Australia, Japan, and India to make this available both in Southeast Asia and uh, the Pacific Islands, and we plan to work this through the Forum Fisheries Agency. Uh, Chairman, I think this is incredibly important. I would love to get a brief on the, the status of this effort. Um, it's, uh, I, I don't think you can understand just how destabilizing it is to lose an entire 
tuna fishery to illegal fishing. Um, I suspect our senator from Alaska has more uh, context <laughs> for this. But it, it is, it, it's one of those issues that, that doesn't always hit the radar screen in the continental United States, but it's incredibly important for all of the, uh, all of our allies in the Pacific, and I think we need to do everything we can to support that. Thank you, Senator. Senator Murkowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to, to the witnesses today, um, and thank you for this hearing. It, it is vitally important. Um, I perhaps come at this with a little bit unique perspective. I may be the only um, member who was actually born in, in a territory. I'm looking at my colleague uh, from Hawaii there, but, uh, but yeah, I was born in one of the territories, so I, have, I relate here. Um, but I'm also one of the few on this committee, though, who was here when we finalized the 2010 compact with Palau. And, and as was pointed out, that was a deal that was a long time in the making. Um, we had good conversations yesterday about this. But you know, my, my recall, my experience with that last round, um, I'm looking at this. And I don't want to be in a situation where it's deja vu all over again. Because as you have pointed out, um, uh, Mr. Yu, um, Ambassador Yun, um, what, what happened in that intervening time period um, was, was, was unfortunate. It was inexcusable on, on many levels, this back and forth. It was, it was literally a situation of, of our federal family pointing fingers at one another in terms of whose responsibility it was to come up to the funding. But that uncertainty, I think, did considerable damage to the reputation of the United States. Um, it, it sent a signal not only to Palau that we might be pretty good at signing things, but our follow through wasn't very good. And it was not just Palau that was paying attention to that. It was others in the region. It was China. And so I, I am very cautious as we're, as we're sitting here today. We, we know that the national security outlook in the Pacific has changed considerably since, since 2010. Um, you know, China is, is not sitting back. They're not sitting on their hands here. And, and Ambassador Yoon, you, you, you encouraged us to read this uh, lengthy letter um, from President Panuelo. And it is really quite telling. I have read it. Um, and it should disturb us all, uh, the actions that they are, are taking. I was going to ask you a question um, very similar to what, uh, what my colleague from New Mexico has asked in terms of what message does inaction on this agreement send to the world. And I think you have articulated that relatively well. I think, uh, Dr. Mohamdas, you have also shared with us um, how the national security outlook in the region has changed in these past 20 years and how this um, advances the urgency, if you will, and the importance of finalizing these agreements in, in an efficient manner. Uh, I, I want to direct this question to you, Ambassador Yoon. Um, uh, the, the issue with the Mar Marshall Islands and uh, the challenges now in getting them on board as a signatory, uh, even though they've signed the MOU, um, it's been identified that insufficient compensation effectively is, is, is what is holding things back. Can you speak uh, first to how important it is that we avoid the situation from the last round when agreements were, were delayed so considerably? And then would you please very generally um, summarize the top line funding amounts and weigh in as to whether or not you think that this is enough. Um, perhaps one way to do that is to compare the compact 2003 level of funding for Marshall Islands and Micronesia and, and the 2010 compact with Palau. Thank you, uh, Senator Murkowski. I think uh, you can understand that with my Marshallese counterparts here, I am a little bit uh, reluctant uh, to, to get into too deeply into the weeds because they are 
uh, new to negotiations. As you know, they've said they've changed the chief negotiator who used to be Kitlan Kabur, now uh, 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 Foreign Minister uh, Jack Adding and uh, chief negotiator Philip Muller are with us today. But we talk friend, uh, frankly with each other as well as the speaker, Keddy, who is here. Uh, I mean, to be again, you know, you, you can ask them the same question. I do believe the, the, the amount we've offered them is, you know, we talked about it months and came to a very satisfactory agreement. In fact, RMI was the first country to agree with our top line offers. And then came Palau next, and then came Micronesia last. So when they agreed, the first to agree, I never thought they would, we would not reach an agreement until now, you know? So I believe there are involved domestic issues there. Uh, there is an election coming up in November, uh, and for a while, you know, there were rumors that there would be a vote of no confidence in the president that would be coming up next week. So, I mean, you know, I, I, you know, again, again, you know, despite being uncomfortable speaking in front of my Marshallese friends, I offer that as maybe partial reasons, you know, domestic politics of course, triumphs everywhere uh, over anything else. And so I told my Marshallese colleagues, listen, there is no more money. You know, 2.3 billion is more than double what we have given them over the last 20 years. And so one reason this compact package is large is because of our concerns that even though our legal responsibility for nuclear testing have been met, we still owe them politically as well as continued radiation and suffering and health effects they are suffering. So we are making allowances for that while upholding our legal responsibility. That's, that's a fine line. Mm -hmm to make sure I don't get into trouble legally with our own legal side, at the same time, do something that is dignified as President Kabua initially said that we should do. And that test is something we met, and they were the first one to sign the MOU. And so am I disappointed? Of course I'm disappointed. But at the end of the day, when it's all settled, I firmly believe they will see that this is an offer that they can meet, that, that that should be acceptable. So there we are. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. And now we have Senator King. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, late last year, I had the occasion to visit New Zealand and Australia with members of the uh, Intelligence Committee and we met with our intelligence community people and also our national security people, the major takeaway from those meetings was the strategic importance of these islands and Pacifica generally. And uh, to say that it, circumstances have changed since 2010 is an understatement. Uh, cir circumstances today are radically different, and China is not watching. They are acting, and they are being very active in terms of everything from uh, corruption of public officials to, uh, I call it debt diplomacy, uh, and, and what we're talking about here could not be more strategically important. I did a quick calculation. The annual cost of this deal is about four one-hundredths of one percent of our annual defense budget. Uh, considering the strategic importance of these islands, and I'm not trying to spoil your negotiating power, Mr. Sec Mr. Ambassador, <laughs> but, but uh, given the strategic importance of these islands, uh, that is a very reasonable price for the American taxpayers to, to bear. So this is a very important item. Now, here's the problem. We've got about 20 legislative days between now and September 30th, and uh, so this We've got to move on this, and I hope that the representatives of the Marshall Islands realize that 
uh, as we talk about here, this is a train that is leaving the station, and it and it's one that we have to get resolved. And, and when we say quick, I wrote in my notes define quick. Uh, we're talking days or weeks, not months, in order to resolve this issue with the Marshall Islands. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Uh, 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 Dr. Mohandas, uh, am I right about the strategic importance? I mean, I, I, we've all touched upon it, but I don't think it, that can be emphasized enough. Um, Senator, you are absolutely right. Uh, this is a key strategic terrain. Uh, the access that we have um, is actually equivalent only to the access that we have in the U.S. homeland, but here it is forward in, a critic, in the priority theater for our national defense strategy. Um, you know, if we, we didn't a, have this access, getting it would be one of our highest strategic priorities, would it not? Yes, sir. Um, Ambassador Yun, uh, one of the proposals has been for the recreation of an office dealing with the freely associated states in the Department of State. Does the department have a position on that? It seems to me that's something that might be uh, important in in resolving the the overall issue and uh, elevating this these islands to their uh, proper importance? I would be personally very supportive of uh, any move to create a structure to deal better with the problems and with issues and challenges that come from co compact states. So. One of my life mottos is structure is policy, and if there's not an office to deal with this policy, it won't be appropriately uh, attended to. Um, on the, on the Marshall issue, I think Mr. Adding testified that the MOU signing was unauthorized or was somehow improper. Uh, is that your understanding, or where does, I'm going to ask him that same question. Uh, that was certainly not my understanding at the time of signing. Okay. Nor well, is it my understanding now. Thank you. Well, I, 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 again, I, I think this is an incredibly important matter to, to be resolved. And uh, uh, 20 legislative days is not a lot. I may be overestimating. Between now and September 30th, and there's a lot of other things on the agenda, including, including a biennial budget. So uh, I, I think that this is really a, a critically important area to, to move as quickly as possible. I see the chairman had to go to an appropriations meeting. Uh, on behalf of the chairman, Senator Hirono. Thank you. I'll take the gavel until the chairman comes back. Senator Kelly. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Ambassador Yoon, um, nice, uh, very nice talking to you at the beginning of the hearing. We talked about veterans a little bit, and um, I understand, you know, that the citizens of the freely associated states serve in our military at some of the highest rates per capita of any community, and often doesn't, do not have access, as we discussed, um, access to veteran benefits, uh, that others who have served um, are, you know, easily obtained. Uh, so, you know, how does this proposed legislation on the compacts, can you talk about how it improves access to benefits earned for those who have served in the U.S. military? Uh, uh, so the legislation, as we have uh, proposed, will give uh, authority to Secretary of Veterans Affairs to offer wide variety of benefits to veterans living in compact states. Uh, at the moment, they ha would have to travel to either Guam or Hawaii to get those services, and these expenses are quite daunting, as you can imagine. So we can, you know, for example, uh, pharmaceutical services can start, as well as telehealth can start. And so once this legislation is in place, it gives authority and leeway to the secretary to, to offer these services. Well, telehealth and uh, pharmacy benefits are incredibly important. Uh, but without access to a clinic and doctors, you know, there's still, you know, it's rather, you know, limited uh, the kind of health care that can be delivered to know, folks who served our country. So in the legislation, is there a proposal to fund uh, physical infrastructure like a clinic um, somewhere within the freely associated states? There is no specific funding for those. But again, 
the Secretary of Veterans Affairs can offer those as well. And, and, and it, when we talk to VA, we've also talked about uh, VA doctors, nurses making trips there. So let's see how VA carries on with this. And so I would hope that as legislation is approved, uh, we will have a more structure in place. Well, thank you, Ambassador. And Madam Chair, I yield back the remainder of my time. Thank you. I'll take five minutes to um, uh, ask my questions. So before I begin, though, I would like unanimous consent in the interest of uh, this committee collecting the viewpoints of a variety of stakeholders uh, in these agreements, I ask unanimous consent to submit the testimony of the COFA Alliance National Network into the record. Hearing no objections, so ordered. There's absolutely no question how strategically important the compacts are, and Ambassador Yoon, you have been working assiduously uh, on these uh, agreements for, I, I would say, close to two years, and certainly my office has been very much uh, in contact with you on an ongoing basis because there are some very important provisions in this uh, iteration of our compacts. And while the, the defense aspects of the compacts continue, the economic uh, support that we provide under the compacts are an integral part of, of these compacts, and that's what uh, what this committee and, um, well, what Congress is confronted with with these agreements. So it does come as news <laughs> to me that uh, the, the uh, Marshall Islands have a concern. They have a, apparently a, a change in leadership, et cetera, that's led to some question as to whether or not their signature on the MOUs are, uh, are, are what we can go by. I'm not sure. But uh, I do share the sense of urgency as expressed by other members of this committee, particularly the, the uh, person to the right at the moment. So we don't have a, a lot of time. Uh, Secretary Cantor, you noted that if the Marshall Islands do not agree to the, these compacts, and, and we cannot force any independent nation to sign these agreements, you say that they will need to, for the economic part, to resort to the trust fund. How much is left in the trust fund for the Marshall Islands? I don't have the exact figure, but I'll get it for you. Does anybody do the other two? It's about 600. Does the fires? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 600 about million. 600 million. 600 million. Over the, the, and that trust fund is supposed to last for 50 years. I don't know how long we're into the trust fund at this point. The, the, the trust funds are designed to last in perpetuity. Oh. And, uh, and so it would be very damaging to go into corpus at this point. Yeah. Uh, we would like to build the trust fund more. And I'm sure uh, my counterparts in RMI would agree that they would want to build it more. And there, so there is about $600 million for the Marshall Islands in the trust fund. Um, meanwhile, there's $2.3 billion for the Marshall Islands under the, these compact agreements. Yes, over the next 20 years, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is up to the Marshallese to decide how they want to allocate some of this economic assistance. Some of that $2.3 billion, yes. Okay. You and I have uh, discussed uh, the idea that we can't wait uh, 20 years before we focus on the portions of the compacts, and there should be an ongoing engagement with the Marshallese. And as President Whip, Whips has said, uh, he has requested that we reestablish an Office of Freely Associated States Affairs at the level of the State Department's Office of Australia, New Zealand, and Pacific Islands. So do you agree? Well, I'll ask the entire panel. Do you think that is a good idea so that we can have an ongoing engagement with our, our uh, friends in our compact nations. I'm not sure my colleagues at State Department would agree, but I certainly would agree. Well, we don't have the State Department sitting here. So, Interior, Secretary Cantor? Yes, I agree with that. Dr. Um, Mohandas? Obviously, defer to the State Department on how it organizes itself, but we're supportive of anything that will enhance relations with the compact states. I think that uh, I certainly agree that th this is something we should do because I recognize that as 
We can't wait 20 years for us to pay attention to the needs of our compact friends. And by the way, this particular compact has two really important pro provisions, and that is the restoration of key public benefits and clearly the veterans benefits that uh, has uh, been discussed. Those are two, uh, I would say, key provisions under these compacts that have been pretty much a long time coming, and we're gonna to need to deal with that. So time is short. I would urge our, our friends from the Marshall Islands to uh, be aware of the time frame, um, and I hope that we can resolve uh, some of these issues. And by, by the way, Ambassador Yoon, are you going to continue to uh, negotiate provisions of the compact? Uh, uh, certainly, I would like to see through these three compacts, ma'am. So is that yes? Are you going to reopen <laughs> negotiations with the Marshallese? Oh, I, of course I'm open to negotiating with Marshallese. I've never been closed. Uh, and, and, and so we are waiting for them uh, to really come back to mm -hmm. us with what more needs to be done, in particular fiscal procedures agreement and trust fund agreement, we need to work out with them. Okay. Um, before I turn to uh, Senator Cortez Masto, I would like to thank you, Ambassador Yoon, in particular for your openness and in including provisions that had not been addressed before. And to the other panelists, thank you very much. Senator Cortez Masto. Thank you, Senator Hirano. Uh, thank you. I, 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 let me just echo the comments of, of my colleagues uh, when I say that the, the freely associated states are vital allies right, of the United States as well as strategic partners. Uh, I thank you for being here in the panel. I look forward to the conversation with the next level uh, set of panelists as well. We know that for nearly 100 years, our countries have worked together to build a freer, more prosperous world. Now at this critical juncture in history, it is imperative for all the reasons that we've just talked about and you've heard today, that we continue our partnership with as much vigor as possible. So I am hopeful that the, the follow through on all of these negotiations uh, with our, our friends and allies come through here because it is so important for the reasons we've talked about. I've just got one follow up and then uh, I'm gonna let this panel um, go. Um, and this is um, for Ambassador Cantor. I know in the past, the Bikini Fund, um, there has been concerns uh, about um, uh, possibly the depletion of those funds um, and lack of oversight by, um, uh, I think, the Department of Interior at times. Uh, it, obviously, there's an important uh, reason uh, why we want to make sure the funds get to where they need to go. Um, uh, so can I ask for the Department of Interior, what, what actions have you taken to really uh, provide that essential oversight uh, for these funds uh, in light of what we have seen in past with the depletion of these funds? Senator, thank you so much for that question. We are very aware of the recent reporting on the KBE uh, management of the trust fund uh, since the 2017 rescript. Um, we have taken this very seriously and we're committed to work to address the concerns of the uh, members of the KBE community uh, we recently received um, an accounting of the current balance. It was almost $59 million back in 2018, and now it's down to almost $100,000. Uh, we are, uh, during the negotiations, we have been working very closely uh, with uh, the other countries, especially trying to strike a balance between, you know, their self-determination and autonomy of their governments, and at the same time, we're trying to make sure that there is, you know, uh, uh, the accountability, the oversight, the transparency is there. You know, we need to make sure that every dollar is, uh, that is being spent on these compacts is, you know, accounted for. Uh, I'm proud of what we have done. Uh, we continue to work with others within the Department of the Interior. We have reached out to the Office of the Inspector General regarding the management of the trust fund. Uh, we might be talking to other members of the interagency as well. But again, we are taking this very seriously. I appreciate uh, all of the, the work that you're doing. Look forward again to the conversation in the next panel as well. Thank you. I'd like to excuse, excuse the first panel. Thank you very much um, for the second panel to come back, and we can start the questioning with uh, Senator Cortez Masto.
Senator Cortez Masto, we can proceed. Sure. I, I wasn't sure if we were giving them opening statements or no. Or they already, oh, they already did. I am so sorry. So I, I, and uh, and I apologize. I, I missed the opening statements. But uh, let me ask uh, to our um, the Honorable Jack Aiding. I've heard the conversations about the agreement and the, in the and the concerns uh, of the compact. Can you uh, address? some of the conversation that some of the senators have brought forward with respect to the signatures and signing of the compact and the concerns that, that you have. Thank you, Senator. Uh, before I answer your question, may I uh, briefly say that uh, I am saddened and uh, disappointed that the, the statement regarding our uh, uh, internal affairs, political internal affairs, what came up about the uh, vote of no confidence. Uh, if there was a, a vote of no conf confidence motion, our speaker here would not be with us today. So uh, I can assure you there is, there is no such uh, vote of no confidence uh, pending in, in our parliament. <clears throat> uh, if, Senator, if you are talking about the MOU, I can say that uh, the MOU uh, was not authorized. It was uh, uh, incomplete MOU. Not all of the issues that we wanted to be in the MOU was in the MOU, even though we discussed it before a former chief negotiator flew over to LA and signed the MOU with uh, Ambassador Yoon, uh, we discussed the uh, other issue that needed to be included in the MOU, and they were not included. So that's why uh, the MOU was not authorized. Thank you. I appreciate that. So based on moving forward, do you think there's an opportunity then, from what you've heard, uh, for negotiations and to move forward to finalize uh, the MOU? And again, like I said, uh, there were issues that uh, needed to be included, and uh, we're happy to uh, continue the uh, negotiation with the with uh, Ambassador Yoon and uh, uh, his uh, delegations on on other matters that we think it should they should have been included, but they're not, and uh, that's why um, uh, the uh, we haven't really endorsed anything yet. Okay, let, let me jump to a separate subject then. Um, the, the conversation around um, infrastructure uh, in, in, the, in the region, infrastructure building and Chinese workers that are coming in, I, I would uh, like to hear specifically, I've heard anecdotally, I am curious from all three of you, uh, what you're seeing uh, uh, in the region with respect to China build out and Chinese workers coming in. And it, I'm assuming that is happening because one, there's a, a challenge to get workers in the first place for construction that needs to be done. Uh, and uh, I, I would just love to hear that conversation and what you're seeing. So I, I don't know, uh, Foreign Minister, since you've already started, if you, if you don't mind um, uh, talking about this issue, if, if there's something that you're aware of. Uh, thank you, Senator. Um, we do have uh, Chinese uh, business folks, business people, in our country, but we don't have any Chinese uh, uh, infrastructure being built at the moment. Do you have infrastructure that's being built, and are you challenged with workers? Yes, we do. Uh, well, in the previous uh, years, because of COVID-19, we had uh, a very, a very uh, uh, challenging with uh, laborers. Uh, as you, we we always uh, uh, we bringing in foreign laborers from Philippines and other countries. Uh, but we stopped, brought, uh, brought those over because of the COVID-19. Currently, we do not have issue with, uh, with, with the, the labor force. force. Thank you. Uh, President Whips. As uh, I mentioned in our opening statement, we have diplomatic relations with Taiwan. Mm -hmm. So therefore, we don't have relations with um, the PRC. However, in the private sector, they are investing. And that's where we see this type of activity. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the investments that they've done is um, low quality, uh, if I would put it, and, and not necessarily in the best interest of what we would like to see. But they've also managed to um, 
secure a lot of property that would be prime real estate for development. Uh, this is kind of the activity that they've done on our island. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and then not do anything with it or build junk. So you, 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 it's a different approach yeah. uh, because of our, our relationship. I appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Falcon, if you have anything else to add. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, on the issue of, uh, of uh, the PRC, mm -hmm. the FSM, as everybody here knows, uh, does have a uh, diplomatic relation with the, uh, relations with the PRC. That uh, diplomatic relations is, is, has its foundations in some economic assistance that we uh, do uh, have from the People's Republic of China. Um, we do have infrastructure projects in terms of uh, vertical, uh, uh, vertical buildings, government buildings, uh, recreational facilities um, that uh, the PRC does bring in uh, PRC laborers for. Now we are very, uh, very attuned and diligent in ensuring uh, that any, uh, any uh, PRC laborers that come in for these projects uh, are there for that specific purpose and that they ensure clearance through uh, U.S. Uh, immigration ports of entry prior uh, to getting into the FSM. Our experience with the kinds of infrastructure that the PRC provides us has been mixed. Some have been uh, of, uh, as, as President Whips has, uh, has made mention of, some have been of uh, a little bit mediocre quality. Others have been, uh, have been up to standards. Uh, but we, we do have a relationship with them and we do have uh, infrastructure projects that they do for us. Thank you. Thank you, all three of you, for being here. Uh, appreciate your comments. I recognize myself for five minutes. Uh, President Whips, uh, thank you very much for your suggestion that we reestablish the Office of Freely Associated States. I take it that that is a, a way for us to remain in contact or discussions with uh, uh, all of you on an ongoing basis as, for, uh, as opposed to waiting 20 years to address some of the issues. So um, State Department was not here, but I think that they're, uh, based on the discussion, I'd say that that is a suggestion that um, I would like to, f to see happen. With regard to uh, <clears throat> Palau, being supported by FEMA. It is my understanding that the Marshall Islands and Micronesia both receive FEMA support. Uh, for some reason, Palau does not. Is that correct? That's why you wanted FEMA assistance going forward? So, for Palau. Uh, President Whips? <coughs> yes, for Palau, sorry. For Palau, uh, FEMA assistance under the compact was taken out. But for FSM and RMI, it was continued, and then my understanding later taken out and changed. Uh, oh. So uh, that's why we feel that. And, and I think the argument at the time was, we don't get typhoons. Uh, I'm sorry. But that, it, that, that's that, that. That seems. But now that's not the case. <laughs> so. So you would like to be in the same position with regard to FEMA support as um, the Marshallese and Micronesia? P President Whips? Uh, yes, and uh, maybe they can help share what FEMA assistance they're getting now. Uh, my understanding is that's also changed. Uh, okay. It's not the same as it was before 2003, if, that's, if they can share. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll figure that part out because I, <laughs> I think that FEMA assistance to Palau would be uh, important. So, uh, Minister Adding, a lot of discussion about the Marshall Islands position with regard to these agreements. And the uh, time is short. And if, if um, we certainly can't force your island nation to sign the, the MOU. And if the MOU is not signed, we cannot go forward with the, uh, with the compacts with regard to the Marshall Islands, correct? Uh, Madam Chair, that is, that is correct. The, as you know, the MOU is a non-binding agreement. And uh, 
to us is not a dignified agreement. And so that's why um, we have that the committee or, or the Congress direct administration to continue the, uh, the discussion on the, on the compact issues. And the concern is, as articulated here, is that if uh, there are no changes with regard to the Marshall Islands uh, in, in terms of economic support, that uh, uh, the Marshall Islands will uh, look to the trust fund, some 600 million left, which gets you into the corpus of the trust fund. Is that the, what would happen if we do not, if the Marshallese do not uh, conclude this agreement? Madam Chair, I I, um, I understand the uh, trust fund was established uh, for the purpose of continue fund funding the uh, operation of the RMI government. Should there be no new no comeback, and Madam, we're uh, uh, we're ready to and we're prepared to uh, go that route. We're prepared to use the comeback the trust fund to continue the uh, operation of our, our nations. That does get you into the corpus of the trust fund, however. So our hope is that there will be a successful resolution so that we can conclude the compacts with all three island nations. Very important for all of us. It's a, a mutually beneficial uh, compact. For uh, Mr. Falcom, uh, are there areas not addressed in the compacts and auxiliary agreements that are a priority for Micronesia? Uh, Ma'am, are you f referring to, did you say areas that are not addressed? They're not covered. Are there additional areas that you would uh, want us to pay attention to? Well, uh, th thank you very much, Senator. As, as you know, um, we are at about the 98, 99% uh, solution for finalizing our federal programs and services agreement. Uh, just two services in particular. Those have not been uh, finalized yet, and I, uh, we are in uh, the final stages of trying to uh, secure the right language and the right terms for USPS uh, and for disaster assistance. Mm. We don't anticipate that that is going to be uh, too much of a challenge, and we anticipate that we'll be able to come uh, to uh, a mutual agreement sometime within the next month is what we're hoping, or sooner. Um, thank you. I thank the panelists, and I turn to Senator King. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Adding, I, I'm somewhat confused. I guess the, you've cast doubt upon the signing of the Memorandum of, under, of Understanding. However, is, are the Marshall Islands acceptance, accepting of the top-line number that's specified in that Memorandum of Understanding? Thank you, Senator. We appreciate uh, uh, what was addressed in that MOU, but we feel like uh, there is uh, there are other issues that needed needed to be included, and uh, especially uh, uh, additional funding for the uh, uh, nuclear uh, uh, affected uh, populations. Uh, so I take it that's a no. You're that is not committed to the top line number that was agreed to in the memorandum of understanding. Is that that's correct? That is correct. Thank you. Uh, well, I I hope that this issue can be resolved because, as I say, when when a train moves through this place, it's you never know when the next one is going to come, and we're going to be doing everything we possibly can to move this these agreements before September 30th, which is going to be a, a minor miracle in itself. So I I hope that you're your people can come to uh, can come to an agreement that's fair, uh, and and takes into account the issues that you've raised today. Uh, thank you all for joining us here today, and and uh, for the seriousness which with with which you've uh, come to the table to treat uh, on this issue. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to thank all of the witnesses, and of course our. A hope and expectation is that these compact negotiations will successfully conclude for the benefit of our island nation friends and for the United States. Uh, members will have until close of business tomorrow to submit additional questions for the record. This committee stands adjourned.